again. Sing it from the depth of your heart. My desire, Father. You are my, my desire. No one else will do. No one else will do. Because nothing else can take your place. Because nothing else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Let me find a way mighty name.
Romans 8 28. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Is somebody ready to shake for the Lord? Come on, just shake. Are you ready?
for the Lord. from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confirm that this morning. Let it be a prayer from the depth of your spirit, irrespective of who you trust or what you trust or where your confidence is during the week. Let it be in the Lord for today and as you go out of this house. Give me this. 
You can say Psalm 23 over you. The Lord is our shield. Makes us to lie down in green pastures. He renews our strength. Jesus bled and died 
for me I see his wounds His hands, his feet The Savior God cast it to Let's sing that again together I cast my mind To Calvary
bless your name, my God. This is a prayer from the depths of our spirits, Lord. We bless you, the one who rose again to give us life. This is not just a song, my God. May it feed our spirits, O oh Lord. For we are living a new life, a new life in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. At the mention of your name, all knees in heaven and earth and even in hell bow down because you are King of Kings. Because of your death and resurrection, no name on earth matches your name. We give praise and glory and honor to the name of the Lord God Almighty. We bless you, King of Kings. We honor you. Be adored, be exalted, be lifted up among the saints this morning. In Jesus' name. Please take your seats. I'll be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then as to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and eats and drinks uh, without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This morning as we take on the Lord's table, few pointers. Number one, let us reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is not a simple matter. It is not a practice. It is not just a ritual. We are doing this as we reflect on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, reflect on yourself. Reflect on yourself to be sure that you're not doing this in an unworthy manner. Reflect on your conscience. Reflect on the state of your soul. And make sure you're doing this specifically in the remembrance of the Lord in honor of the glory of his name. Let's start. Please take the bread and the cup in your hand as the it is distributed.
Let us take the bread together. And now the cup. Dear Lord, we thank you for your people for whom you died and resurrected. You're seated in glory, but you will come back to take them home. And as we do this in remembrance of your death and resurrection on the cross and the truth that will one day be with you, may this be a reflection of your presence 
and your Holy Spirit that you've left to guide us through the journey. And we pray that this moment shall be a moment of grace, that the Lord's table shall extend grace in the hearts of each and everyone who has gathered here today. It shall also be a healing upon each and everyone who is gathered here today. And it shall be an instrument of sanctification in the hearts of everyone who is gathered here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please pass the cups to the aisle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Such a pleasure to see you this morning. For everyone who has made it here today, can I just say thank you? Can you just help me clap for your neighbor who has made it? Because this rain really just wanted to mess up today, but I was so happy that many of us have been able to weather the rain and come together to worship. Thank you so much for making it. Is there anyone who is worshiping with us for the very first time? Please, can you just wave at me if you're worshiping for the first time? Ha, ah, there's someone there. Please clap. Is that how you're celebrating our first time visitors? Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome to UCF. We are so pleased to have you here. And in UCF, our vision is to is to build disciples that model Christ's characters before God and man. And we are pleased, we are always pleased to have you worship. If you have a home church, please take our greetings to them. But if you don't, please make yourself part of this family. And we would so much love to do life with you. Please, can you put your hands together one more time for them? Thank you so much for coming. On Wednesdays, we have our midweek services from 5 to 7. And on Sundays, our services begin at 10.30 towards 11.30. But yet if you're a youth on Sunday in the evening by four, the youths meet together just to fellowship together. And um, on Friday, we have the real brothers and uh, the sisters who come together to, to meet. These are sisters, gents, and males on campus. They come to meet here every Friday by five. So please make yourself, if you fall in that category, please make yourself part of that fellowship hallelujah in case there's anyone who is wondering how you can be part of ministry in UCF we have the ushers we have the choir we have the media team the technical guys um, the intercessory wing if you have any questions and you want to know how you can do ministry it's important one thing we believe in UCF is that we are served to, to serve we are saved to serve so as much as we are served as we are saved sorry we know it's important to serve so please meet the just go to the usher's table and then find out how you can be part of ministry here at UCF and God is blessing you immediately in the name of Jesus amen on the 9th of June we are going to do a musical farewell for our sister sister Anita Nassisiria who we lost earlier this year so please mark your calendars 9th of June is just next week I think so please get ready as we come and give our final farewell and um, say goodbye to her for the last time also on the 30th of June Maisha Capital just the financial wing just behind here they're going to have their first quarterly meeting for this year so please on the 30th of June by 5 by three here in church towards 5.30. Let's make ourselves available as we get to know more about Maisha, get to know how we can be part of that ministry. Amen. I'm pleased to announce the return of mentorship program. Is there anyone who's excited about mentorship? I know that's joy. I'm not liking that joy this morning. Is there anyone who is excited about mentorship? Can you just give those hands together? Thank you. I know we are not that cold. It's cold, but we are not that cold. So let's just warm ourselves up a bit. So mentorship is launching for the first time this year with a topic, finding your purpose. So as many people who, I mean, this year has been, has been quite tough, 
right from last year. So many people's businesses have crashed. I mean, people have faced hard times that you can sometimes you just feel like, what is really my purpose in life? Is it just to wear face masks and spray hand sanitizer? So come for that program and let's rediscover purpose together in the midst of all of this that's going on. So on the 7th of June, that's just Monday, next week Monday yes please so let's make ourselves available for that program and we know that we would go back with something new something to add on to our lives in the name of Jesus amen um, lastly okay I think we can give now okay so please can you put your hands into your pockets as we give to God this morning can the, can the ushers please hang around as we pray for, for the giving? Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you for an opportunity to give to you. And we ask that this morning, out of the abundance you've given to us, we give to you this morning from our hearts as a sign that we honor you, as a sign that we reverence that you are the giver. And so we ask that you receive our giving this morning and that you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ushers, please wait on us. Can we bow down our heads and thank God for the giving? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for the giving of these, your children. We thank you for enabling them to give whatever you have allowed them to give. And God, we pray that you bless them, God, and multiply them my, my, mightily, Jesus. We also pray for those that were willing to give but did not have what to give today, that you provide for them that they'll be able to also give the next time. Thank you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we believed and prayed. Amen. Can we rise up on our feet and join the choir? Sing this simple song.
the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace sing this with me let's sing that let's sing it. the Lord bless you
be upon us, behind us, no children, no families, and our children, and their children, and their children, may his presence go before us, and behind us, and beside us, all around us, and within us, he's with us, he's with us, in the morning like this, in the evening, in our coming, even when it's raining, in the dimming. Oh. Attendant, and this person was a, an, an old farmer. He used to rear, used to rear sheep. And uh, so he thought, okay, he, let, let's, let's keep, let's, let's keep talking to these to each other and wait and wait and wait and when they waited and nobody came he decided okay let me just do the let us just do the preaching so he decided to preach and he preached and he preached and he preached so he finally asked the the uh, at the end of the service or the sermon he asked the the farmer how was the preaching and the farmer said you know for me when i'm keeping sheep if it is time for them to eat when I, when, when I call the sheep and only one comes up, I don't feed it the food for a hundred sheep. I only give it enough for one sheep. And I can promise you that this morning, I will not feed you sheep for a thousand sheep. I'll give you just enough. It is, it is a very discouraging weather. It is a cold one, but I promise you, hell is hot. Hell is hot. And we would rather be here on a cold morning than spend the rest of eternity burning up in warmth. Thank you very much for making it, for daring the rain, for making the choice to, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, to spend the rest of the eternity uh, in a better warmth. Please turn with me to Ezra chapter 8. And the title of our sermon today is God is for you. God is for you. And we are going to talk about three ways in which God is for his people in their restoration journey. Three ways in which God is for his people in their restoration journey. Restoration takes a very, very sometimes a long time longer than we had anticipated and for the israelites at this point ezra had been given the authority and permission by the king and he had been given some resources to go home and he had been told take everything that you can uh, from you know from the temple treasures take everyone that you can go with now three days into the journey uh, sometime into the journey, Ezra stopped at a river point and he said, you know, before we go, we need, to, we, we need to really seek God about our journey. We need to really know where we are right now and how we are going to go forward. Because they discovered that they had not told the king, they had not asked the king for soldiers and people to protect them on the way. And remember, these were refugees, you know, exiles who were returning home. They, they were not experts in military warfare and stuff like that. They may have been governors, they, have, they may have held other positions, but they, they were not necessarily fighters. They may have been some fighters among them, but they were not a majority. And Ezra looked at this situation and he said, wow, have I made a mistake? Have I made a mistake? I didn't ask the king for an army, for horses, and for people to work as our security detail. So he called for a prayer. Um, and, but, but also, as, as, he, as he looked at the people, he realized that some people were missing. Some people with specific skills who were going to be useful in the restoration process, in the repair of the temple, but also in the service in the temple going forward. Uh, you know, if you read the book of Nehemiah, you'll find that they were singers, they were security people, some security people, there were repairmen, carpenters, uh, there were all kinds of people. But some of those people were missing at this point. So Ezra sends somebody to go and talk 
uh, to someone else and say, hey, join the team, join the team, we are going for restoration. And, and I'm telling you, not everyone came. In fact, if you read both the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, you'll find that some people said, no, we are not going for your restoration. We are not going, we are not going to return with you. And yet their skills were needed. Their skills were needed. They said, no, we are not going. But some people came. Some people came. And after they had prayed for some time, they set out on their journey and they arrived in Jerusalem. They rested and they started real, real, real hard work of repairing, not just finishing the repair of the temple, but also working on the lives, the spiritual lives of the people. And this is where we pick up from where Ezra has just left the king's presence and he's about to take on a journey but he stops and realizes that there are some things that are missing. And that's where we are going to reflect on this morning. Three ways in which God is for his people. Three ways in which God is for his people. Number one, God connects you to amazing people. Now, you know, when, when we say God is for people, uh, someone thinks, well, I, I want God to manifest his presence for me to realize that he is with me. But sometimes, yes, God is with you and he's with you by connecting you to other amazing people. Let us read from the book of Ezra, uh, chapter 8, verse 18. The Bible says from the NIV, because the gracious hand of our God was on us, he brought us, he brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of Mali, a son of Levi or Levi, the son of Israel and Sherebiah's sons and brothers in all. If you read the New American Standard Bible, it is, more, it is even more clear. It says, and the good hand of our God was upon us. They brought us a man of insight from those, from the sons of Mali. Here's, here's the thing. The, 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 the good hand of the Lord was upon these people to connect them to amazing people. Remember, Ezra sent out a call for people who wanted to return home to come. Nehemiah sent out a call for people who wanted to return home to come. The king himself decreed that people who wanted to return home should return. But specific people said, no, no, we, we are not going home. We, we, we love it here. We, we, we love the exile. We are not coming with you. And, and, and in, this, in this critical time when Ezra wants specific skills for the work of restoration to proceed, God is with Ezra by connecting him to an amazing person. The NRV says a capable man. The New American Standard Bible says a man of insight. The New King James Version says a man of understanding. And, and the Bible is really amazing because specific people are usually given a line Sometimes a sentence that describes the whole of their lives. What is a man who is capable? How, how do you know that? How do you know a man who has insight? How do you know somebody who has understanding? How do you know? Let me illustrate with a few examples. Have you ever talked to somebody and then... In a moment, they, they say, oh, uh, by the way, you can, you can do this, this, and this. And you're like, ah, why didn't I think of that? Have you ever been in a, a difficult situation and you spoke to someone and, and, and somebody says, hey, I see you're struggling with this. Um, I, you know, do one, two, three, four. Uh, can we just pray about it first? Uh, before you act, can you pray? You know, people who have specific words, specific way in which they understand the world that they speak into your life at a specific time that happens to be just the thing you need. 
I know uh, many of us when we are with when we are having some problem the first place we go to is Facebook and we're like oh I have this problem can you help me and we, we have a series of people who, re, who are responding uh, if, you, if you're on Twitter it's 184 characters 184 characters is it 184 or 164 164 or 84 characters and in that short amount, people are seeking solutions to major problems in life from 184 characters. And a lot of people comment and say, do this, do this, do this. And, and if you check, um, you know, um, what's her name? Uh, you know, several famous people. But, but one, 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 one that shows up on my timeline is Lucky Mbawazi and even sometimes um, Power FM. People post and say, I am in this relationship mess. Um, please give me advice. And you see a lot of people without understanding, commenting. Oh, do this. 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 Where do you find people of insight? Where do you find people of insight? From Ezra's story, we can understand that these people of insight are connected to the covenant community of God. And in the New Testament, the, the, the thing that is described, the, the gift, the ability that is described as insight is word of knowledge or word of wisdom. Now, a few people think that, you know, Word of knowledge or word of wisdom is somebody being in a, a hyper spiritual situation and then they say something and then you're like, wow, that's, that's really cool. But from the New Testament perspective, it is not coming up with strange, you know, um, oracle-like oracle-like situations like, oh, brother, I've been, I've been praying and when I was praying for you, this thing, uh, the Lord spoke to me, this word of wisdom, I've, this word of knowledge, this word of wisdom, the word of knowledge and word of wisdom is used specifically for people who have a general understanding of how to apply the word of God in specific situations at specific times. Have you ever talked to a Christian brother or a Christian sister and they're like, ah, the Bible says this. They, they are spitting out the word of God at the wrong time and they are quoting the right scripture but they do not know how to apply it at the right moment. Be very, 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 very concerned. It doesn't matter how much somebody prays and fasts and stands in the presence of God. Not everyone has the, the, the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge. Not everyone has insight. So be very careful about people from whom you seek advice. You know, when you see guys like in, in uh, somebody posted and saying, uh, you know, guys stand somewhere without shirts, with vests, with shorts. They don't even know each other, but they are giving each other relationship advice. Somebody doesn't know your name. Somebody just came, I have a problem. Uh, and, and people just start speaking. This is common with guys. They just start speaking. Oh, do this. I, I was... I was, I was in this, this kind of situation. Oh, do this. I was in this kind of situation. Oh, do this. The people who give relationship advice and end it with, it will end in tears. Those are the people. People of insight know when to apply the word of God to a specific situation. And I pray this morning that may the Lord connect you to people of insight. Whenever somebody comes to me to ask for advice, the first thing I ask them is, who do you listen to? And it involves preachers, you know, who they listen to because people have this tendency 
of coming to you for advice and then they go and listen to some preacher somewhere that you know they are listening to the wrong thing. But they want to listen from you to, to go and measure up if your advice will also measure up to the advice of the preacher they are listening to who does not understand their situation. Oh, my man of God said this. Calm down and study the word of God. And, and, and you, you Christian brothers and sisters who, who, who spend time in the presence of God, be very, very seek, seek, seek for the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom to be a gift for you. Because you, you, you may critically unleash scripture on somebody who is struggling with a situation at a time in which that scripture does not need to be applied to them. Just because you're spiritual does not mean you have understanding. And just because you pray does not mean you have wisdom. Here's what someone said. A moment's insight is sometimes worth a life's experience. Now, when, 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 we, when we see kids, uh, there is an amazing kid, uh, and he's always saying amazing things. We, we sometimes say, this kid is speaking like an adult. This kid is speaking like an adult. And, and you can see that the gift of insight is starting to build up in them because they are starting to understand not because they have experience but because they are starting to connect the world better and faster now some of you when you when you started saying things like this you were beaten when you were younger they don't say adult things but a moment's insight can be a whole lot worth of a life's experience. And I know that the, the more adult people uh, among us will, will sometimes feel like, eh, these young people are not recognizing my experience. They are not recognizing my experience. But sometimes the young person, be, even if they do not have you, the years of experience that you have, they, they have an insight into the situation that you do not have. It is not that we should throw away experience. But we should respect that at a certain time, because of what God needs done, there can be insight given to some people who do not have experience. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12.32, it talks of the, the men of Isaac, the tribe of Isaac, as being a group of people who understood the times. A group of people who understood the times. And the Bible says they were able to direct Israel on the best course of action because they understood the times. Understanding is not brought about by data. Understanding is not brought about by data. Understanding is not brought about by information. Understanding is not brought about by accumulating a lot of information on your head. It is not.
Here's, here's, here's something that I've come across that usually disturbs me. When people make general comments, derogatory comments about the tribes around us because of their experience with one person from that tribe. Ah, these people are like this. These people are like this. Ah. My friend who comes from Western Uganda, we were discussing uh, uh, some issues. And he said, when he was young, he was told, specifically by his parents, you know, his aunties, that don't bring us an animal. Do not bring us an animal. And you know who they were referring to? People from northern Uganda. Now, that is one area. Now, me from northern Uganda, the other side, when I was young, I was being taught a song to sing that said that everyone who is this side of the lake is a thief. Now, that is information. That is information. That, that, is, that is data. Understanding comes when you translate that information into real life. When you meet, if you, from Western Uganda, if you meet a woman or a man from Northern Uganda and you actually experience are these people animals? Then you get understanding. Understanding comes when you, like from me, from northern Uganda, you leave northern Uganda, uh, you leave a beer, you come to Kampala, and you actually experience, is everyone a thief who lives this side? That is understanding. I pray that, number one, you seek to be a man and woman of insight. Number two, God connects you to men and women of insight. Praise the Lord. Here are three, three or four things you can do. As you... You know, I, I like the word they've, they've chosen for the mentorship class, rediscovering your purpose. As, as, you re, as you're in the recovery process, as you're in the restoration process, uh, reflect on where you are in the journey, number one, and say, all right, this is where I am. This is where I am in life. And, and this is where I am going. Like Ezra, Ezra, instead of just starting the journey to Jerusalem, he stopped and he said, guys, we, we, need, to, we need to look and see if things are okay. We need to look and see if things are okay. And then number two, identify the kind of people you need in, for your vision to move forward or for the vision that God has put in your heart to move forward. And, and number three, reach out to them. And number four, be expectant for God to connect you to amazing people. And, and right now, uh, there's a lot of young people here if you've surrounded yourself with people who think like you, people who, who, whose topic lines, whose, whose lines of conversation are the same as yours, I, I can assure you, you will not have any insight in life. You will not have any insight. In fact, I was thinking about this and I said, if many young people had insight, many companies would forego their lack of experience and offer them jobs because they have insight. If many young people were able to translate real life information and data into something that is applicable, many companies would forego their lack of experience and offer them jobs. But the reason they want you to have experience is because they know you've come raw from, from, from university. You've come raw from university and, and you do not know how to translate the information you have into real life experience. They know that.
All right. Secondly, before I move, are you hearing? Are you hearing? Number two, Ezra chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible says, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him. But his anger is against all those who forsake him. Basically, Ezra set himself up for potential failure. And, and the question we, we are asking here is, what truth do you know about God that no one and no situation can separate you from? What, what is that truth that you hold so dear about God that nothing can separate you from? For Ezra, for Ezra, it was, it was the favor of God, the hand of God, as, as the, the, the New American Standard Bible puts it, the favorable hand of God is upon everyone who seeks him. Everyone who seeks God will have the favorable hand of God. And that's why a person like Ezra is able to risk his reputation, is able to risk the lives of the people, is able to risk everything to bet on the promise of God because he knew it to be true. The promises of the Bible are, are difficult to apply in real life. Because whenever we are met with a situation, we begin to panic. And we just can't place our hands on, on the right promise to rely on. But And that leads us sometimes to, you know, to just browse around the Bible to look for words of encouragement. We just kind of, you know, do that thing of, Lord, I'm opening the Bible wherever it lands. I want you to speak to me through it. What if it lands where Judas betrayed Jesus? Will it mean that you have to betray Jesus? The, 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 the idea of somebody being able to hold on to the promise of God, even if his life is at risk and his reputation is at risk, is because somebody knows that when God says, I will do something, he cannot backtrack from it. But the, the scriptures, you know, 66 books, you, you must know a lot from the Bible to be able to apply the word of God at the right time. You must know a lot from the Bible to be able to say, this is the scripture that applies to my life at this point. There is, there is an interesting situation here that I want us to see. Ezra had the right to ask for an army. He could just go back to the king and say, ah, boss, I forgot. Please give me an, give, give me an army. And the king would say, have, have, have anything you want. Have, have, have an army, have soldiers, have horses. I can give you my personal escorts if you want. But Ezra was in a situation in which, in which the promise of God, the, the credibility of God was at stake because he had said, God does it. He, he had already spoken and said, 
you know, God actually, God's hand is favorably disposed for, to, to, to those who seek him. God's hand is favorably disposed. And, and this is what it means to live by the scripture. It means when you've, when you've uttered the scripture and, and you've spoken the scripture and you've asserted that scripture as part of your life, you do not backtrack from what you've said. You follow through because not only is, is the Bible, the Bible's credibility, not only is it at stake, but your own life is at stake because you, you cannot say God will provide and then you go and be corrupt. Are you saying God's provision is by corruption? You cannot say God will provide and then you sell yourself to get money. You cannot say for students who are here that, that God gives wisdom and then you cheat exams. Are you saying God is a cheater? You cannot say God is truth uh, and, and then you lie. And, and what Ezra is doing here is following a, a, a higher virtue. The lesser virtue for him would have been to go to the king and say, King, we need soldiers. The higher virtue for him is to say, we'll stick to what we have said God does. And God has to see it through. Whenever many of us are confronted with these kinds of situations, we don't even think about, you know, you know we don't even think about, okay, what, what do I have to do right now? We, because whenever you make this claim, uh, the devil opens doors for you to, to say, the devil is like, you're saying there, but there is here. There is obviously here. You, you can, don't, 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 don't step, don't over, don't over be religious. There is, there is a, a door here. If you just do one lie like this, you, you'll get through. Um, if you just cheat, you'll just do one question. You don't, you don't have to cheat the entire paper. You just have to, you, you just have to get 50, 50. The rest you'll manage. There's a door here. Here are some four things you can do. As God is for you. You see, and, and the point here is that God proves his character through your situation when you decide to rely on him, not before. When you say God is reliable, God gives you a situation to test and to prove his reliability. And, and it's a two-sided street. When you say God is reliable, two things will happen. God will put you in a situation. For you, it is a test. For God, it is to prove himself in your life. The decisions you make at that point will either give God the opportunity to prove himself or give you the opportunity to prove God's word false. For you, it is a test. For God, it is a proofing system. God does not prove his words in thin air. God proves his word in our lives by taking us through a situation. If this is the promise, just know a situation will follow. The, the, moment, the moment you read the Bible and say, ah, today the devotion has been good. God, I will rely on your promise. That very day, a situation will show up that will test. For you, it will be a test. If you truly mean to trust God when he says this. And then afterwards, either your faith will grow or you'll backtrack. Number, number one here is what, what you can do. Be thoroughly acquainted with scriptures. 
this needs needs no emphasis number two proclaim boldly who you know God to be according to the scriptures um, I like it when people post the, their selfies on, on social media and they're like uh, all things work for good for those who love the Lord then a week later they're questioning whether all things work for good for those who love the Lord number three trust completely in God and not man or human resources trust completely in God and not man or human resources and number four be expectant for God to answer you according to his promises here's the third and the last way in which God shows up for his people he delivers you from expected dangers in Ezra chapter 8 verse 31 it says and the hand of our God was upon us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from the ambush along the road as you're taking the journey the idea in this verse is that there will be dangers on the road and there will be ambush but the Lord will deliver you the Lord will deliver you and we're usually hyped up by posit, you know, the positive mindset movement, which says you, you can do anything, uh, nothing is an obstacle, and stuff like that. But, but what those people don't tell us is that there will be obstacles. There will be people who will fight against you. There will be dangers, and, and you should expect dangers. You should expect that people will be against you. You should expect it. You should expect as you walk out of here that somebody, the devil, the world, something is against you. Ultimately, the devil is against you all the time. And if you are not living with that awareness when you're taking the journey, it catches you by surprise. But knowing, expecting it, expected dangers, being in a position that you are aware that God will deliver me from expected dangers, will put you in a situation where you're not surprised if somebody attacks you, if somebody character assassinates you if somebody says I saw so and so they were doing this and this you will not be surprised that people do this in the church dangers will come but God will deliver you from expected dangers I would like you to think what dangers are you expecting right now what dangers are you expecting in your life right now? I have, I have a list. I have a list of dangers. One danger is that next week, I'm not sure if I'll, I'll do my, my school assignment project alone well. That's one danger. But, but I'm going at it anyway. There are lots of dangers along the way that I am just expecting. But I also know that God, like Ezra says, God delivers you from these dangers. You expect them, but God delivers you from them. Some of you may be having interviews next week. And the question is, are you walking in expecting to be rejected? You should expect it. But you should know that God will deliver you from it. Whether, you know, there's, he can give you the job or he can put your heart in a place where if you get the rejection you're steady, you're not losing it and blaming it on the government here are four things that you can do be thoroughly aware of the dangers you face human dangers you know your flesh your lust your eyes job says i made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a young woman lustfully the world the devil but also be thoroughly acquainted with god's promises so that you can know how to respond to these dangers and number three Take your journey 
Like, if the, if the danger is there, go right through it. You might face the rejection, go right through it. Write that application. Write it. The job will not fall down from heaven. Go right through the danger. Go right through the danger. You, you want to talk with you know, a, a big partner to do something, go right through it. Go right through it. If they respond yes, it's yes. You thank God and move forward, but move forward. As Martin Luther King uh, Jr. says, if, if, if we'll walk, if, if we cannot run, we'll walk. If we cannot walk, we'll crawl. But by all means, keep moving. You move because you know God is for you. I would like to take a turn and not end the way the, the PowerPoint will be showing. I would like us to reflect about our lives and ask ourselves genuinely, like do, for point one, do an audit of the people around you and ask yourself, are they people of wisdom or insight or understanding? Just, just take a moment and do that. Like the friends you have, the people around you, do, do they show any, any inch of wisdom and insight? Just think about it. And, and while you're thinking about that, also thinking about how am I seeking God? Because the favorable hand of God is disposed to people who are seeking Him. Not people who are not seeking Him, but people who are seeking God. Are you seeking God? And lastly, what dangers are you expecting? And, and let us take a moment and just pray individually, just pray. Just pray in regard to those three points. Who are the people surrounding me? Am I seeking God right now? And what are the dangers ahead of me? Today, next week, God is for you in three ways. Number one, he's connecting you to people of insight and knowledge and wisdom and resources you don't have. Number two, if you're seeking him, his hand will be favorably disposed toward you. And number three, whatever dangers you have, God will deliver you from them. Let us stand. children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your
your family and your children and the children and the children's favor is very upon you and a thousand generations your family and your children and the children and the children and the children's Just this moment when when Joshua was speaking, the Lord just reminded me of how blessed I am to be here today. And if you've come today and you do not know how blessed you are, just search for it. Just take a moment and just reflect on on it. Just think about how blessed you are to even be alive to make it here today many have really given up some have given reasons some have thought it through and thought of the weather and it blocked their blessing but you have come you have made it today there's a special blessing that the Lord wants you to receive from this place and how I pray that when we sing this song that we ask for this blessing and partake of it because it belongs to us it belongs to you who has come today let's sing together may his favor be upon me and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children the truth is favor is be upon you upon and a thousand generations generation. your family your family your children your children the children the children may his favor the children his favor be upon you Thank you. 